one announcement so let's hear from Becky good morning um, we are continuing to do some cleanup projects around the church we've been focusing on the kitchen and the lounge uh, we've identified a lot of surplus which we're going to try to sell or donate if anybody's interested in seeing what's down there they're welcome to go down after service and decide if they need anything. So far we've got dishes, glasses, vases, punch bowls, and a few assorted things. So feel free to go downstairs and take a look around. Thank you. Morning. First thing, let me let everyone know, the cold water is not working on this side of the building. We had a flush valve open up in the women's bathroom and it ran off. I, I just shut the water off. So right now we do not have any cold water on this side. 
If you go into the school building, that first bathroom, that handicapped bathroom, that one is functional. And I did open the door so you can get at it. Okay, planning is underway for an alpha course. It's a Bible study starting in September. This is an 11-week course designed to reach out to those who are willing to explore life the Christian faith in a friendly, open, and informal environment. It originated 30 years ago in an Anglican church of the Holy Trinity in Brownsville, in London. And over 29 million people have participated worldwide. Pastor Luffy is offering it seven times at Royal Redeemer. Discussion is underway on how to offer it as an outreach event to the community of Rocky River for four years to come. Thank you. You're welcome. And now it's time to greet each other, please. And the peace of the Lord with you. Peace of the Lord with you. Here you go. Peace with you. Be with you. God's peace with you. God's peace with you. God's peace with you. We worship now in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Why don't you please remain standing as we sing.
God is our refuge and strength. The Mighty One, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth. Invited by the grace of God as his baptized children, we entreat his mercy, confessing our sins and receiving his forgiveness. O oh, most merciful Father, hear our plea for your constant help in the struggle of living in the strength of our baptism into the death and resurrection of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We lay our sins on his atoning death. Raise us in the assurance of your forgiveness and your power to create a new and contrite heart that we may serve you in holiness and forever sing your praises both now and forever. Hear us for the sake of Jesus, our Lord and our eternal King. Amen. The Almighty God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given you the new birth of water and the Spirit, strengthen you with his grace. In the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Splendor and majesty are before him. We will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. For great is his steadfast love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Now as it was in the beginning. you. Let us pray. O oh Lord, you have called us to enter your kingdom through the narrow door. Guide us by your word and spirit, and lead us now and always in the feast of your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. from Isaiah chapter 66. For I know their works and their thoughts, and the time is coming to gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory, and I will set a sign among them, and from them I will send survivors to the nations, to Shart, Tarshish, Pool, and Lud, who draw the bow, to Tubal, Javan, to the coastlands afar off, that have not heard my fame or seen my glory. And they shall declare my glory among the nations, and they shall bring all your brothers from all the nations as an offering to the Lord, on horses, and in chariots, and in litters, and on mules, and on dromedaries, to my holy mountain Jerusalem, says the Lord. Just as the Israelites bring their grain offering in a clean vessel to the house of the Lord, and some of them also I will take for priests and for Levites, says the Lord. For as the new heavens and the new earth that I make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your offspring and your name remain. From new moon to new moon and from Sabbath to Sabbath, all flesh shall come to worship before me, declares the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle is from Hebrews chapter 14. In your struggle against sin, you have not resisted to the point of shedding your blood, and have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be wary 
when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest, and the sound of a trumpet, and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them, for they could not endure the order that was given. Even if a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. We have, you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festo gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. This is the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. People will come from east and west and from north and south and recline in the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Please rise for the gospel. Jesus went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. And, to, and someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? And Jesus said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, open to us, and then he will answer you, I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, We ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourself are cast out. And people will come from east and west and from north and south and recline in the table of the kingdom of God. And behold, some who are last will be first, and some who are first will be last. So far the Gospel reading. We join now in confessing our common faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made. 
and who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, I, for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated.
We're getting near the end of our series on the book of First Peter. Two more Sundays to go. And I'd like to start this thought process about our text by noting the dilemma that we Christians, New Testament Christians, have when it comes to understanding the causes of our behavior as followers of Christ. The dilemma is that the Old Testament presents the life of a Jewish people as the covenant that God has uh, established with his people and along with that goes the expectation of the kind of behavior God is looking for. And so we wind up with lots of prophetic proclamations uh, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel in particular, condemning God's people for going astray from following their sovereign Lord. And we pick up some of that tone in our uh, lesson today, except they're just kind of the reverse. In this particular case, the uh, Old Testament lesson has uh, the statement about the victory of Christ and those coming, the victory of God the Father and those coming to him. And our New Testament lessons harken back. And this is what makes it a dilemma. Because, for you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of the trumpet and the voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. Even a beast touches the mountain will be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. So I could uh, stand up here and cause, give you cause to tremble for fear. Pick up a little bit also. Uh, in the gospel lesson when once the master of the house had risen and shut the door and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door saying Lord open to us then he will answer you I do not know where you come from and thus we have the expectation God is holy God is just he will judge us according to our deeds the other side of the dilemma is the constant message that we are saved from our sins by Christ's sacrifice for our sake. And so when we stand before God at the final judgment, we proclaim that we are followers of your Son who has forgiven us our sins. And we stand before you on, based on his merit, not our own lack of merits on our part. And God says, come, join the kingdom. You are welcome here. The dilemma between judgment and forgiveness in Christ is something we need to be continually juggling. In our lesson on 1 Peter, we're doing chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. And I want to pick up in verse 5. The uh, statement that, but they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. And that raises the question of an accounting for your life before God. We don't have to worry about the final judgment. Christ took care of that for us. But we do need to be rendering an account of our life day by day and week by week and we do that with the confession of sins that we said this morning as we do every Sunday morning as we stand before God and give an accounting of where we have fallen short and a good confession of sins enables us to think specifics in our lives as we stand before God and then we receive his forgiveness his forgiveness for the sins that we have done. And that's the way the gospel works its way out in terms of daily repentance and daily forgiveness. 
So we don't have to fear the final judgment, but we do hold ourselves accountable before God for our daily and routine living and sins that, come, that become part of our life as sinners. So how do we behave? That's the question that uh, drives Peter. And again and again he comes to how these aliens and strangers should be behaving in the society around them. They are part of a new kingdom, God's new kingdom, that sets them apart from the kingdom of the world around them. And Peter's message, over and over again, is that our morality as Christians is different from the morality of people living around us in the world that don't know Christ. Today, uh, I mean currently, uh, I think of the fashion of morality that has to do with uh, the climate and how striking it is and how quickly so many people have lined up behind climate concerns and that becomes the compelling morality for so many lives today. I don't say that the climate is a lack of concern but among all the things that involve being a Christian today that's hardly at the top of the list of the things to worry about. And so we also get messages about behaving against systemic racism. I'm all for that, but on the other hand, I'm not sure there's much we can do about systemic racism uh, other than to be sure that we in our own attitudes and behaviors towards people from other backgrounds that we remain fair and equal. Uh, it's very hard to attack systemic racism because we deal with people, not big ideas. And so it's difficult to watch in the news as we see people forcing that issue of systemic racism. And I, for one, as a white man, say that if you define racism in such a way that by being white I'm guilty, I can't buy that. That's not the, my understanding of how we ought to be behaving as Christians. We certainly need to treat each other with fairness, and we certainly ought to be offering equal opportunity, but that doesn't involve equal results. And to hold us accountable for equal results just basically has a, a different understanding of the nature of man and we see it in the current news about progressive attorney generals who have in many cases stopped prosecuting minor crimes and letting minor criminals out of jail well what happens surprise they're sinners we're sinners do you expect people on their own to be able to improve their life or do we believe as Christians and followers of the Bible that we're all sinners and so we shouldn't be surprised when people sin given the opportunity to do it. The kind of morality that I think Peter uh, addresses to us as Christians would come under the phrase, what would Jesus do? And, and that's our challenge as Christians to be continually asking that. And so we pick up in verse 3 of chapter 4. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans chose to do. And here's an interesting list. Living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, detestable idolatry. They think it's strange that you do not plunge into them into the same flood of dissipation and they heap abuse on you but they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead so are you living different from the way pagans do I'll use the biblical word unbelievers uh, again the news that I follow 
seems to say that the whole sexual revolution is a really dangerous thing. Dangerous in terms of what it does to the people who live in, let's use the word, debauchery. Uh, I don't know how much orgy, or, orgies go on out there, but given what's happened on the sexual revolution in our culture, I wouldn't be surprised that there are a fair number. What would Jesus do? Well, he would certainly shun that kind of life. Our challenge is to offer the alternative and the fuller, the more wholesome, the happier life that comes to people who are willing to do what Jesus does in their own personal life. What are God's expectations? We have that image of Matthew chapter 25 in the final judgment and he says to those on his right that you have cared for the weak and the poor and the hungry therefore your, your behavior is acceptable. It's kind of murky in terms of what that does for the final ju judgment because that particular passage doesn't address uh, salvation in Christ. But we know the kind of behavior that God expects of us, that Jesus expects of us, and that is we look out for those who are less fortunate than we, for those who are sick, for those who are lost for those uh, who really don't know what a wholesome life is in relation to God and his gifts. We live in mission. What would Jesus do? Well, look at his life. He came into this world for a mission, and that mission was to love all people and demonstrate the forgiveness in God. He came with a mandate. What would Jesus do? He would have us go out and uh, save all nations, proclaiming the gospel to them. What's the incentive? Why should we take mission seriously? And the incentive is that there is a final judgment. Where does the power come from to do mission? In Jesus Christ, and he talks in this passage about the gift of love that uh, of the gift of God, of Christ's Spirit, the Holy Spirit that empowers us to do this, and the urgency. There is a final day. We've been waiting for it for 2,000 years, but that doesn't mean it's not going to happen next month or next year. And so we have that kind of urgency. And frankly, I've been the one that's been promoting this Alpha course that is starting to surface now as a great opportunity to reach out in mission to this community, Rocky River in particular, through the Alpha Course, which is more than just a normal Bible study for members of, Rock, of Royal St. Thomas. It's a challenge to invite people in the community to come and answer the basics of the Christian life with a special emphasis on a weekend of learning about the Holy Spirit and what he does in our lives. Don't know where this is going to go. Uh, decisions need to be made before we know the full impact of the, of the program and how well we can do it here. But that's a direction to take on, to put some hands on the mission task that we have as God's people. There's one other passage in this section of 1 Peter that I want to highlight for you. Again, the end of all things is near. Therefore be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Keep diligent. Keep your relationship with God active. Verse 8, above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. grumbling. That's the basic mandate that Peter gives, that Paul gives, that Jesus gives. God is love, and Jesus came to exercise his love and to create an environment where people do respect and love each other. And then comes what 
for me is a very favored passage. Each one should use whatever gift he has rece received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. I'm big on spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. To each, uh, as a member of a fellowship, is given the manifestation of the Holy Spirit for the common good of all. And that's a new understanding of a very old passage that got looked, overlooked in much of tradition, uh, that everybody in this congregation is given a gift of the Spirit to exercise for the good of all others. And why I love this passage is that you should faithfully administer that. We're just learning how to do that uh, in Lutheran circles. Well, in all Protestant circles, it's a development of the last 30 or 40 years that we could intentionally try to help people identify their gifts from the Spirit. And how do you know whether you're gifted by the Spirit? Number one, you enjoy doing it. And number two, you do it well. Uh, and when gifts of the Spirit are faithfully administered, you have people who are delighted to be serving one another because they do it well and they get good affirmation. That's our challenge constantly as a congregation and uh, learning how better to help you each identify what God has gifted you to be able to do and then help you plug into the congregational life in a way that does that. I close with the last verse of chapter 4, verse, uh, the section I've been doing. Uh, this is verse 11. To him be glory and power forever and ever. If anyone provide, anyone serves, he should do it with the strength of, that God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. Is your life living out uh, the way Christ would do? What would Jesus Himself do in this constant question, constant? or a rhythm of life. As I mentioned, it doesn't affect our final judgment before God because we stand before Him based on what Christ has done for us, but it does affect our daily living. What would Jesus do? What would He have you do? Do it. That's kind of the bottom line, and God will empower that for you. Dear Lord, our Heavenly Father, you send those conflicting messages about the final days and the wrath that is to come to those who don't know Jesus. Let that be our incentive for mission to others. Help us discover and then put to use our particular gifts from the Spirit to improve the quality of our life as a congregation. In Jesus' name, amen.
Please rise for prayer. Almighty God, we give thanks to you for all your goodness and bless you for the love that sustains us from day to day. We praise you for the gift of your Son, our Savior, in whom we have redemption, forgiveness of sins. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, for your Holy Church, for the means of grace, for the lives of all faithful and just people, and for the hope of the life to come. Help us to remain constant in the struggle of faith, empowered by the cross of Christ, filled with hope and confidence. Lord, in your mercy. Save and defend your whole church and strengthen your faithful people through the word and the holy sacraments, establishing in them the faith once delivered to the saints. Lord, in your mercy. Grant your wisdom and heavenly grace to all pastors and to those who hold offices of service in your church, that by their work and example and a faith may abound and your kingdom will increase into all the earth. Lord, in your mercy. Preserve our nation in justice and honor and grant health and favor to all who bear the offices of government in our land. Guard and protect also all who serve in the armed forces in our country. Give them faithfulness and success in their service and grant their homecomings that be, they be joyful. Lord, in your mercy. By your word and Holy Spirit, comfort all who are in sorrow, need, sickness, or adversity. Be with those also who suffer persecution for the faith. Have mercy on all to whom death draws near. Sustain and bless all who care for those who suffer. Lord, in your mercy. We remember with thanksgiving those who have loved and served you in your church on earth, who now rest from their labors. Keep us in fellowship with all your saints and bring us at last to the joys of your heavenly kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So remember us in your kingdom, and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.
me Find the ringing and the singing Then the end of all the war Find the living, find the loving Evermore, evermore Find the prize, find the wonderful surprise Find the banquet, then the praise Then the justice of thy ways Find the glory, find the story, then the welcome to the least. Find the wonder all increasing at the feast, at the feast. The glory in the night, no more dying, only light. Find the river, find the tree, then the Lamb eternally. Then the holy, holy, holy celebration jubilee. Thine the splendor, thine the brightness, only thee, only thee. <laughs>